Greetings and welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am not a journalist. I am a bass player and songwriter from the Gem City, Dayton, Ohio. My guests today, there are two of them, are both journalists. So these are people who are professional music listeners, and we're going to talk about our favorite music of 2022 on the You Could Be My Aramis podcast. This conversation broke the record for my longest ever episode. I hope that you can tell how much the three of us just love music, and I hope that you discover something that you like from this conversation. Oh, there's Taylor Ruckel, and there's Juliet from Holt. How is everyone? Doing well, doing well. Happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Before we get to the fun, I would like each of you to address the listeners and tell them what you do in your own words. Now, they'll probably remember you, Juliet, if they've been around because you you did this a year ago with me. But, you know, maybe not. It's been a while. That's right. Was I was I like your preview episode as you were getting launched? You were. Ooh, thank you for that honor. Well, hello again to Mike's listeners. I'm Juliet Fromholt. I'm the music director at WYSO, the public radio station in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, I host two music shows, Kaleidoscope and Alpharithms. And in my free time, I do a podcast called Attack of the Final Girls, which is about uh, intersectional feminism in horror films. <laughs> That's H O R R O R. Correct. And uh, I am Taylor Ruckel, and I am a freelance music journalist. Uh, I write for publications like Post Trash, Flood Magazine, The Washington City Paper, and Vinyl Me Please. Which is a lot. In other it's... words, both of you love music. That's true. You could say yes, that. Very much so. So we have gathered here today as Prince might say, to talk about our, <laughs> our favorite records of 2022. I was just talking to a fellow music lover yesterday who has not really gotten a chance to listen to any music in 2022. You know, people are busy. That is and so also, sad. There's a lot of music. And so for people like that who might not know, hey, what, what recent is good, we're going to try to help you with that. And... One thing that I've learned when I was making my own list is I started reading other publications year end lists and realized, oh, there's so much stuff that I just plain missed. <laughs> and that's okay. We can't get to it all. But hopefully through this conversation, you will find at least one thing that you go here and you end up loving it. And if that happens, then this was all worth it because we like, we like to share our passion for music with people. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, in the spirit of ladies first, uh, Juliet, you're you're the first person that gets to talk about uh, your favorite. Uh, yeah, let's pick one of your top ten. All right. Um, I mean, I have mine ranked, so I guess I'll start with my number ten to uh, make the big reveal for number one later. Um, my number ten is a local release that I am so excited about. It is the debut self-titled album from Heather Redman and The Reputation. I have followed Heather's career for a really long time. She and I have been kind of in the same local music circles um, since I started my career in radio eons ago at this point. And I've always known Heather as part of a really amazing band. In this uh, group, she is taking the role of front woman. She is uh, backed by an incredible group of Dayton musicians, and she's really taking the lead. And it's so exciting. I have known about this album officially and, un and unofficially for quite a while. And it's such a triumph to see her really stepping into her own voice with a big like rock soul sound. It's a uh, it's a really cool album. If you're looking for a good neo soul pick, definitely check this one out. That's really well stated. Uh, do you remember back when she was in Late Night Drivers? That's, that's been a long time ago. 
Absolutely. Yes. I can remember seeing her in late night drivers at elbows. Yeah. Uh, RIP <laughs> back in the ago. day. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I've been following her for that long, have always admired her voice and her stage presence. And it's really, it's always exciting for me to see somebody kind of level up as a musician and a performer. And this is definitely a level up for her. Yeah. Uh, when you go, you know, she's currently in the Neo-American Pioneers, dear listeners, especially those of you who in Dayton might know this, but uh, you can go see them and they, they play a song like Fever and you're like, oh, yeah, like she's got the big pipes, but she's like a co-lead singer in that band, right? And so, yeah, I like your point, Juliet. Like she's the voice of this project and it's, if you like 70s kind of soul influence rock and roll, this is a record for you. Absolutely. Cool. Taylor's turn. This is see, this is what I love about uh this endeavor is I'm I'm getting to hear about some of your local favorites. I'm gonna share with you some of my local favorites. This first pick though, if we're starting at uh from 10, which I think is probably a good way to do it, is not a local, you know, uh uh concern. Uh it's my record is going to be bleed out by the mountain goats for my first pick here. Uh this is a band I've been following for years and years. Um and uh, I was surprised to like this record as much as I, I did. Um, this is John Darnell dipping back into his mode of concept albums. Um, in the past, he's written about things like professional wrestling or dragons. And this time it's about action movies, which is very fun. But also uh, he uses it sometimes as a meta commentary on writing songs about characters in extreme situations. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is one actually my mom got into before I did because she knows I'm a huge Mountain Goats fan. And so when this record came out, she texted me the day of like, hey, have you heard the new Mountain Goats album? Um, and we wound up going to see see the band in uh, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and they put on just such an amazing show. It sold me on the album. Um, one of the best shows I saw this year, they're getting so much better as a live act. Uh, I don't think of them as a two guitar band usually, but they have just gotten so much better at that mode. Um, the energy is just incredible on songs like uh, Mark on You is the one I recommend to check out if you're curious about this record, um, especially for a band that's been around as long as they have. Um, seeing them play live, I go through the process of, oh, the saxophone player is the best part of this band. Oh, the drummer is the best part of this band. And just kind of down the line, every song rotating, who's my favorite member of this band. So the songwriting is is definitely the main attraction here with John Darnell being such a lyrical, I mean, um, kind of literary writer um but they're just becoming such a great all-around live band and it uh it is reflected on this record but it's even better when you see them perform these songs live so that's my recommendation you know taylor usually when you recommend records i have not heard them mm -hmm. i've actually got to this one this year yes I, what did I you feel, think i thought it sounded like brandon berry uh, who is a friend of mine, and now I know where Brandon Berry gets his sound. Brandon Berry is a, a young, uh, former Dayton musician who's moved away, but uh, he's a big Mountain Goats fan. And when I listen to that band, that's, that's like I feel like I've heard it channeled through another artist. Yeah, it's, it's. I liked it. I did not dislike it. I definitely had that experience the first time I heard it. That was the kind of phrasing I would use is I did not dislike it, but it wasn't one of my favorite Mountain Goats records. Um, and then, yeah, you know, usually I, I don't tend to judge records this way, but seeing them live kind of unlocked it for me and uh, made this one of my favorite records of the year, just because it was also such a great quintessential live experience for me this year. Well, and sometimes you need more than one listen to really that too, more, right? That too. Totally. Did you hear this one, Juliet? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like John Darnielle is like the one person who can keep doing concept and themed albums. And you're not just like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> you know, you're like every time he comes out with like a new themed or concept album, I'm just like, all right, let's hear it. I want to hear your take on it because you're such an interesting writer. Even if it's not my new favorite Mountain Goats album, it's always going to be something really, really interesting and engaging. I don't know of any other songwriter who could pull off the chorus. Um, we may run out of bullets. We're never going to run out of hostages as like yeah. a big triumphant <laughs> sing along. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, that's how I felt about the pro wrestling album. Yeah. Champ. I was just like, oh, come on. Oh, yeah. come on. And uh -huh. I still find myself singing like Chavo Guerrero. You yes. know, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> totally. 
I'm going to take that as a lyrical challenge, by the way, to come up with something <laughs> crazier than that. that still works. That's so, a good exercise. Yeah. I did not rank mine one to ten. I ranked number one, but the rest of them are all nebulous. So I'm going to try to pattern match. So Juliet started with a local artist. I'm going to start with a Dayton artist, the venerable Guided by Voices, who released three records this year because, of course, they did. And that is it, what they do. It's <laughs> what they do. And I have done not a good job of keeping track of them the last, say, six, seven years because they, it's, just, it's just too much. Um, and you would think that with the volume of material they put out, there's a lot of just garbage throwaway songs. Uh, but Crystal Nunn's Cathedral made my top ten. That was the first of the three they put out this year. And there's nothing garbage or throwaway on it. It's 12 songs, which is a lot shorter than Guided by Voices records used to be. It's really pristinely produced, which is a different, you know, they didn't used to do that either. And there's sounds in there, like, you know, full, like, string sections, which, you know, very well might be done in the box, but different textures than you would usually expect from Bob and his boys. But it's the same swagger and bravado and interesting lyrics and weird song titles and just hooky hooky power pop songs so yeah go get crystal nuns cathedral and turn the volume real up it's a solid rock and roll record from probably the most iconic dayton rock and roll band yeah i dig it it's um i i it's funny because um that album is also on um my buddy Dave Obenauer's list. Um, he and I do our lists together on the air here at YSO. And uh, I was surprised that it wasn't his number one because he's like a big GBV fan. And I'm a little bit of a GBV naysayer. Like I will admit <laughs> that. Like I love them. I respect them. But I'm also, I get a little over it sometimes in part of, it, it's partially, it's hard to be, I'll just say it. It's hard to be a woman and a GBV fan in this town sometimes. Oh, like it, I get it. It really is. You know, it's a boys club and I and I get it. Whatever. Um, but I like Crystal Nuns Cathedral. I felt like um, you know, of their myriad offerings, especially the past few years, that one was definitely the one that I locked in with the most, where I was like, okay, yeah, this is this is good. This is solid. I'm digging it. Uh, we played that one on the air quite a bit this year. That's cool. I need to get more into this band. I'm I'm very naturally drawn to these sorts of artists who are these like very prolific, compulsive, creative types. And so I know I'm just waiting for it to, for the lightning to strike and and I'm for me to get very very into this band. I just haven't quite crossed the event horizon yet. It's hard, and in this town, look, they cast a wide, wide and long shadow around <laughs> rock and roll in this state around indie rock. They're basically indie rock royalty. Um, and there was a time when I was really familiar with their material, there's like a 10 year stretch where I bought everything they put out. And then, but this is too much. This yeah. Crystal Nuns Cathedral is their 35th official Guided by Voices LP. Unreal. There were two yeah. more this year, and that does not count side projects, solo albums, and random stuff that, uh, here's a bunch of songs that didn't make an LP on like an EP. Like, it's, it's truly overwhelming. Uh, I have, a, I have a pick like this later on, so we'll get to that. Yeah. But since I love you, Taylor, I, I'm going to send you later via email because it'll take, like, if we turn this into a Guided by Voices conversation, it'll <laughs> end of, like, we'll just go for an hour. But, That's a uh, whole other podcast. It's a whole other podcast. <laughs> but I will email you, like, here are the five. I appreciate that. That would actually be with. super helpful. <laughs> should syllabus. I make it ten? Should I make it five or ten, Juliet? That's the question. Um, I think you could honestly do 10 because of the length of their career too. Cause if you're talking different eras of GBV, you know, um, there's like the classic stuff, the in-between stuff, the modern stuff, the early stuff. I think you could get a good representation with 10, honestly. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Tyler. I'll be, be ambitious. Give me 10. Let's do it next nice year. Thing we'll is, be back. A lot of their songs from back in the day are like 90 seconds. I do appreciate that. With the occasional 30-second song. Yep. So <laughs> you can plow through some of those old records pretty quick. Julie turn. Okay. My number nine is uh, Take It Like a Man by Amanda Shires. Um, I, first and foremost, 
I love a solid album that you can sing or scream sing along to very, very loudly in the car. And this is definitely that. But moreover, I love an album with solid song craft. Um, I love an album, again, that sees an artist kind of level up. So the story behind this one is that Amanda Shires was actually considering um, ending her music career prior to this album. She, you know, in addition to her own work and working with her spouse, Jason Isbell, um, had her group, The High Women, and was just starting to feel like, especially as a solo artist and as an, a performer, a fiddler, that as a woman in the industry, she was just giving so much of herself physically, creatively, emotionally, and just not getting a lot back and not feeling kind of well supported by the industry. I was just feeling really drained and, and was thinking, eh, I think I'm done. I haven't had good relationships with producers in the past. This might be it for me. And she was kind of coaxed back into it um, with the producer with whom she worked on this album, who just created a really safe and nurturing space for her to uh, create these songs. And the result is beautiful and and there's um a strength and a vulnerability to this album that I just really love and appreciate and if you dig this album I highly recommend listening to her interview with Terry Gross from Fresh Air about it because she really lays out kind of the whole story that I think is not a unique story about women in the music industry um and it'll give you some additional context to what's already just a really really wonderful album this one's on my top 10, too, so I, I'll just double up here. Nice. I have not heard this yet, but I have heard of her, and uh, I heard another interview she gave that made me very interested. So uh, this is this is homework for me. I definitely want to catch up with this one. You know, her husband sang on one of his songs, Mama Want to Change That Nashville Sound, But They're Never Gonna Let Her. And you just know that was about Amanda, as many of his songs uh, are about his lovely and talented wife. And I have a long and tumultuous relationship with the concept of country music. And ostensibly, Amanda Shires is a country artist. I mean, she plays what they call a fiddle, even though it's a musical violin, but it's a fiddle. Uh, so I've never actually listened to one of her records start to finish. This does not sound like a country record to me. Like that, it's got that. And maybe it's because of the producer, uh, Lawrence Rothman, and, and what they brought to the table, but it's got that kind of very pop sheen. Mm -hmm. except for like there's one song that's really I'm going to remember what it's called here uh, there's a song that's really stripped down and sounds almost like a soul kind of lonely at night I think that's the one almost kind of like a soul gospel -y deal and there are other sounds here that don't remind me at all of country music and the songwriting's good so yeah good record yeah, she kind of occupies that same space that all of my favorite Nico Case albums do, mm. where it's like, you know, that she has her roots in country music, but it's not necessarily a country album. It's just, you know, one of those sort of genre defying, really solid albums by a really solid songwriter that, you know, toggles between country and pop and rock and roots and soul and all of those things uh, in the best possible way. And just to say something about her personality, because both her and her husband seem like just wonderful people. Are you familiar with the story of how she became friends with Britney Spencer? Mm -mm. So Britney Spencer, and I'm probably going to quote it wrong, but if you Google it, you'll, you'll find it correctly. Britney Spencer like covered one of her songs on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. It's a very talented songwriter and musician but completely unknown and there, because there's a lot of people like that in our country, right? And uh, Amanda Shire saw it and reached out to her and was like, you want to come by the house and write with me and Jason? <laughs> <laughs> and Brittany Spencer like ended up on this record. I'm pretty sure that uh, Jason has given her opening slots on a few tours and like now they're all friends. She's credited with uh, backup on this record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you watch some of the, uh, they did some of those nifty live in the studio performances where they spent probably a whole pile of money to rent out like one of those fancy uh, big label studios in Nashville and got in there with a the camera crew and, and played a few songs and Britney's in there doing harmonies and it's, she could really sing. Um, Very cool. Yeah. It is also like 
not only is it enjoyable just to see musicians at the top of their game playing live and you know there's nothing fake there but jason is the guitarist and he is not in any way the star of this production <laughs> like he's just playing his assigned guitar parts back there in the back and i'm like okay i, I like a guy that can set us set aside the he's the star because he gotta respect star. that yeah and just play the songs it's it's pretty cool very Taylor's turn. All right, I'm up next. And this one is uh, now it's local from my neck of the woods because there's a ton of great music coming out of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Mike, I know you have been enjoying that new Daisy record from this year, uh, which is not what I'm going to talk about, um, but I, I'm sure we'll have that later on. Um, I want to talk about uh, the hip hop scene down there and in particular, an artist called Ty Sorrell, who is a great rapper and producer um, who whose latest record was a big hit with me this summer. It's called Homegrown. Uh, and it's this, it's very clearly the kind of record you make for yourself and for your friends. You can feel a lot of the specificity and personality of this local Richmond scene. Um, but it's also got just really great poppy hooks on these songs. Um, the song Summer of 18 is sort of a good starting point, I recommend. It's the one that first grabbed me. They're using these kinds of um, old and, and potentially kind of cheesy sounding R&B instrumental samples that get repurposed into this really nostalgic, very like kind of humid summary production aesthetic, um, very Southern, very, very catchy record, very enjoyable. And, um, you know, just very neat as a way of kind of capturing this very specific, you know, time and place and, um, um, you know, group of artists. They're part of this collective called Tribe 95 from there of other artists, uh, rappers and producers. And uh, it's a really neat sort of look into that kind of, um, you know, musical world. You wrote an article on this uh, gentleman for Post Trash. Yes, uh, not gentleman, non-binary individual, but yes, I, I, did a, um, I did a review of this record. And um, it's a very, very good, you know, it's, it's exciting. Uh, there's so much cool local um, art to follow down there. And uh, uh, Richmond is one of those places I go for shows pretty often because living close to D.C., it's just sort of a couple hours down the road. And uh, I'm actually going down because they're curating a um, Loop Sessions event in February, um, which is this sort of, of producer and beat maker event where um, everybody has a day to sample from the same pre-selected record and then present a track by the end of the day. And so Ty Sorrell is providing the crate for the February event. And uh, I'm very looking forward to going down and see what they select. Cool. That's awesome. I am so excited to see local hip hop scenes getting elevated and highlighted more beyond their communities. I mean, I feel like we're starting to see that here in Dayton too. Um, and it's just really exciting for me. I'm, I'm excited to dive into this person's work and learn a little more about a hip hop scene that is not, you know, from here in Ohio. Hip hop is folk music. Yes, absolutely. And, and people, some people don't get it, but if you go by the definition of folk music, hip hop is folk music. And that tends to be, community-based and hyper-local. And kind of the globalization of that genre takes a little bit of the charm out of it. So I agree. I can't wait to get in and listen to this record and, and hear some Richmond hip-hop. Uh, I already talked about one because I had the same as Juliet. So, so we're back to Juliet now. All right. Well, funny enough, my number eight is actually a hip hop release, albeit not a local one. Um, one of my favorite uh, collaborations this year, Cheat Codes by Danger Mouse and Black Thought. Um, you know, just two of, you know, for my money, some of the greatest minds in, you know, sort of modern indie hip hop, although this was released on BMG, so maybe not as indie as they were back in the day. Um, but still, um, these guys are just such a good example of, you know, what mainstream hip hop can be at its finest, you know, just solid beats that have a nod to the past, but still sound fresh, uh, incredible lyrics and rhymes that you can easily kind of get lost in the beat and have some fun with it. Or you can sit back and really listen to what these guys are saying and say, Oh, Hey, wow. Did he just say that? Did that guy just say that? Um, they've got a lot of guests on this album, including the late great MF doom. And I just, I really love this one. It's been a really popular one around the station. We were all really excited when we heard it was coming and it definitely completely delivered. 
yeah, this is one of those records I, I really I gave it uh, my, you know, one listen to see what everybody's talking about. And could it's one of those things where you recognize like, oh, yeah, this is this is definitely good. I need to sink more time into it. But very, very uh, worthy, worthy entry here. I didn't get to that one. So now it's on my list. OK, Taylor. Uh, just for the sake of continuity, I might skip ahead, actually, and give another one of my favorite hip hop records from this year, plus the MF Doom crossover, because I really uh, was a fan this year of the new Open Mike Eagle record component system with the auto reverse. Um, Open Mike Eagle being this rapper who was based in L.A., but uh, comes from Chicago and um, is known for very kind of deep conceptual records. Um, and this time I think it's kind of a fake out because on one level, it's a tribute to his teenage years growing up in Chicago, freestyling, making mixtapes from underground rap radio. And it morphs into this really poignant look at, at kind of not only the trajectory of his career, but kind of the impact of the pandemic on creativity and, um, has this really, you know, very moving eulogy for MF doom, who was a major influence of his and a, a collaborator, um, and it also has one of my favorite songs in his whole catalog, which is called 79th and Stony Island um, with a just amazing beat by Kelly Chris. Um, some of his best, very, very clever, very heartfelt uh, wordplay, both in one. And uh, yeah, this was one that really has stuck with me uh, since it came out. That's one that I absolutely need to spend more time with. I've given it a couple of listens and I'm like, oh, I like this and I want to sit down with it. But as always, there's so much music. Yeah, there's so to much get to get to. One. Yeah. This is another one I've never heard of. Can you oh. say the artist's name again really slowly so I make sure I don't write it down wrong? Yes, his name is Open Mike Eagle. Uh, like and, open uh, Mike, like my name or Open Mike, like an event? Like your name. But obviously. But you see what works. he did there. Yeah, yeah, I do see what he did there. This record is great. Also, if, if you are looking for a starting point, I can't recommend highly enough that you check out his album, uh, Dark Comedy, which is a stone cold classic. Just great front to back. Can't can't be beat. Definitely on the list. See, this is why I like talking to you guys, because all this stuff that I don't hear. I, um, I got to interview him this year, and it was definitely one of my most starstruck interview moments I've had. Um, I am going to talk about Sheramondis, which is a very difficult name to say. Uh, Sheramondis is an artist from Columbus who I personally know, but this is someone I met through networking connections. I was looking for a black violinist for my current project, and I couldn't find one here locally. And... Nothing wrong with expanding your search nationally, but I wanted to work with someone locally as often as possible. And I was looking at some of Kay Carter's Instagram pictures from a show he did in Columbus, and there was a black lady playing violin in one of them. And so I'm like, yo, Kay Carter, uh, who is this lady, and can you give me her social media handle? And and then I slipped into the DMs, or slid into the DMs and tried not to be creepy. Um, slipped into the DMs is a much less grateful way, of, I mean, is, graceful, yeah. rather, way of, uh, is, of well, getting there. That, as an old person, it probably was more like that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I am not trying to be creepy, but hey, you know, I <laughs> love to work with you, and it worked out. So now we're friends, and she played on, on the record that I'm going to put out in 2023, but this is about her. Uh, she's She goes to Ohio State, She's a music major, a uh, classical pianist, which is a tough world to be a minority in, and we talked about that a little bit. She really had to love the music to, to stay in that world and be not like everyone else in it. Uh, also plays violin, also sings, and also writes, and she put out her first... Uh, well, I mean, she's made music before. This is her first well-produced full project this year. It's called Dove Archer. Kind of soulful R&B grooves, a lot of throwback feel to the 70s. But what really makes it is she can just really, really sing. And I think the kid has star potential. Now, obviously, in this business, it doesn't that doesn't mean much because there's so many factors outside of how good you are that determine whether you, quote, make it. But I think this album is definitely worth your attention. 
Dove Archer by Sharamondis J. And I don't think she knows that I put it in my top ten. I should probably tell her. Uh, over to Juliet. Well, I just want to say I'm excited about checking out this artist and, and, you know, especially with a, with a K Carter endorsement on the side there, I'm like, okay, this is somebody I need to listen to. And, and just, you know, right over in Columbus, I'm, I'm so excited about your pick Mike. So I can't wait. All right. So a little pivot for my next one, although an obvious choice for those that know me. Uh, my number seven is Fossera, the new album from Bjork. Now, I'm a huge Bjork fan, so obvious pick. Um, but I'm always interested to see what she's going to do on an album, because although there are creative threads that run throughout her work, there's always something a little different about every album. There's always some theming or some instrumentation. And on this one, there are kind of two organizing principles. The first of which I knew about going into the album, which is Bjork's new album is about fungus. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. That's Sign that. me up. Yeah. yeah, I'm in. Great. Awesome. Um, which is true. But moreover, uh, sonically, she's doing a lot with bass in this album and unusual bass, in particular, uh, bass clarinets. Um, there is something like, and I can't remember the exact number some ridiculous number of bass clarinets on this album, which I love, you know, that's not an instrument you hear in sort of modern alt pop indie, whatever you want to call the genre that Bjork occupies. Um, but moreover, you know, beyond all of the, let's say avant-garde sounds that you always expect from a Bjork album, there's also just some really solid things happening lyrically. Uh, the first single, was all about connection and our willing lack of connection sometimes. And that really spoke to me right off the bat. So this is just another solid offering from an artist that I absolutely love and really delivered what I wanted in a new Bjork album. I missed this one. But if it's bass heavy, I mean, I'm going to be all this about This is for it. you, Mike. This yeah. is your Bjork yes. album. This is, yeah. this this is, is yours. Definitely, I think she's like just a fantastically genius artist um but i have not kept track of what she's been up to recently so yeah another one to go on the list awesome. it's nice that she has this sort of like persistent background presence in music you know like she's always up to something and i appreciate that about her yeah and i like that she can do a themed album and it's not as a seminal artist like it it, it, she has carved out a space for herself as an artist that it's like, oh, Bjork's doing a bass heavy album about fungus. And it's not like, ooh, she's gone off the deep end. This is yeah. going to be the weird one. It's like, no, that's just what Bjork is doing. Yeah. And, like, of course she is. Yeah. yeah. And we all want to hear it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like at this point, I don't know that you could say that there is a weird one because that's just. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which she do you just, single out? She, she's Bjork. Yes. Yeah. To Taylor. Oh, okay. So my next one is going to be uh, Save the Baby by Enumclaw. This is a band from Tacoma, Washington, um, playing this very scrappy and lightly shoegazy indie rock. Um, I know Mike's ears just perked up because I said shoegazy, but uh, it's it's sort of minor uh, it, on this record. There's a couple songs where it really comes to the foreground. There's a song called uh, Jimmy Neutron. I don't know why it's called that. It is not about the cartoon show Jimmy Neutron, um, but it has this really amazing fuzzy um, guitar going on that I think you would really appreciate. Um, this was one of my go-to albums for autumnal vibes this year. Uh, the lead singer, Aramis Johnson, has kind of an unconventional voice. And once you kind of spend the time to acquire a taste for it, it really gets gets in there in your brain. Um, but mostly, I just I love how much atmosphere this record has and how much heart it has. Um, again, I, I'm going to use the word scrappy. They're a band that you really want to root for. Um, they've been going around calling themselves the best band since Oasis, which is basically music writer catnip, and I'm obliged to mention it. Um, but uh, 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 it's not so much a one-to-one -one comparison uh, to their sound as it is a way of saying, hey, we're really serious about what we're doing here, and uh, uh, we you know, want to connect with people. And I think the record does bear that out. It's a lot of that kind of classic rock and roll mindset of wanting to be bigger than your small town. And um, it has that kind of working class grit to it. That is really, um, really, really good. 
you're hitting a lot of the buttons with me here. Like, okay, shoegaze, yeah, shoe shoe. comparison, small town grit. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, this is a good one. And it's one of those that, that hit really hard with a really specific contingent of music writers, but I think might have, have missed a lot of people who would really enjoy it. So this is one of those I'm, I'm, you know, shouting from the rooftops everywhere I go. I did not hear this one. So thank you. I think it's time to talk about Daisy. I've waited long enough. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it won't take long. Uh, I had never even heard of Daisy, who is apparently from Richmond. Yeah. Uh, this is a person named James, but Daisy is the performance name. And I read a blog, actually a Chicago-based writer's blog. Uh, the gentleman's name is Josh Terry. Oh, yes. I to give credit where due. and. He just had a quick blurb about this record, and uh, the quote that he said was, Imagine if every Fallons of Wayne song was written to be played at ear-shattering volumes. And I was like, uh, yeah, um, I will go listen to this, like, right now. And I did, and I love the record, and it made my top ten. It's exactly right. It reminds me so much of Fountains of Wayne, but if they were less concerned about being pristine in their arrangements and just wanted to be loud. So yeah, it's like yeah. that same songwriting aesthetic, but angrier guitars. I, I don't have anything bad to say about it. The, uh, the latest album is called Out of Body. It's awesome. Taylor's probably seen my performances, no? Perhaps? <laughs> no, I actually have not. I had not heard of this band, and it's one of those that makes me mad because it's like, what do you mean they're right down the road from me and nobody told me about this band? But it comes out, and all of a sudden, it's making such a big splash. No, this record is kind of a, an unimpeachable pick. It's, it's, it is, as you say, you know, like, um, it has this very, you know, kind of 2000s aesthetic that I love. Um, the songs are all, yeah. Yeah, Fountains of Wayne is a good is a good comparison there. It's just very energetic. It's super catchy. Um, I can't poke any holes in this record either. Now, like the songs are brief. The subject matter is everyday mundane stuff. Like it's Fountains of Wayne. Just sure. Just kind of like with dirtier production. Yeah, for sure. Like, what's there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Juliet. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you would have fun playing on the radio. And uh, yeah, I'm, I completely miss this one. But again, just like Taylor's pick, I'm like, okay, like you're checking all of the boxes here. Fountains of Wayne comparison. Yes. All right. Yeah. That <laughs> sounds like it would work very well on the radio. Yeah. yeah. And, and the songs are mostly pretty brief. I mean, it's not that I have a problem with long songs, but like you can consume this album in like less than an hour and be like, oh, that's a good listen. I need to try it again. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like we are on number six, and my number six is Painless by Nilifer Yanya. She is an amazing UK-based artist, uh, really coming into her own relatively young and started off just kind of self-producing some SoundCloud stuff, really finding her sound, uh, produced a debut studio album in 2019, I believe. This is her follow-up and sees her going more in a rock and roll direction, which she will emphasize a lot because critics still try to kind of, in her mind, pigeonhole her into R&B. Um, but she's just, she's fantastic. I love seeing a young artist who's really discovering themselves and their sound and has, <clears throat> excuse me, and has the solid songwriting and musical chops to back it up. She's somebody that I want to watch as she progresses. She's already talking about on her next release. Does she want to self-produce? Does she want to take that creative control? And I'm really excited to see what she does next. I did get to see her live this year and she puts on a wonderful live show as well. Um, this is an artist who I was really happy to discover and I'm absolutely looking forward to seeing more of in the future. Did you think some of the songs on this record one I actually listen to. Uh, did you think some of these songs sounded Radiohead-esque? Oh, yeah. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, especially when you have an artist who is younger, you are getting to not only 
witness their growth as a musician, but witness the expansion of their taste that kind of happens as we all age, as we all discover new things and, you know, um, delve into different things. Um, you can hear both her taste and her skills expanding on this release. So yeah, there's definitely some radio head in there. I, I feel like not to fall back on the R and B comparison, because this artist is way more R and B. I feel like she is um, a less sunnier Arlo Parks. And they're both UK based artists. They both had albums in the past year and I love them both. Arlo Parks was on my list last year and there's a through line there, but Arlo Parks is still a little thematically heavy, but much sunnier in terms of sound. Nila for Yanya definitely goes for a heavier, more rock based sound, whereas Arlo tends to go in more of a sunnier, like R&B kind of motown -y sound. This is very interesting. This is a name I've heard a lot this you know, the past couple months as I've been seeing lists and I haven't made my way to it now. And um, uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to. I want to be clear. I don't need you to say Radiohead to get me to listen to an artist, but <laughs> it doesn't hurt necessarily. Uh, I thought this was good. It made my list of here's stuff I really dug, but just didn't quite make my top 10. It's a yeah. bucket for me. It's it's really good. I wish that I knew that there was a chance to see her live because I, well, to be fair, I only discovered her like three weeks ago. So, well, admittedly, this was not in Ohio that I saw her live. So, <laughs> I mean, I know how to fly. True, true that, true that. I, I went to Philadelphia for a show this year. So, this was in Philadelphia. Well, in fact. Oh, see now. <laughs> You guys go all the way. I haven't gone to Philly for a show in maybe ever, actually. <laughs> in my defense, I had never been to Philadelphia. And my wife has a cousin there that she had never met at the time. And one of my favorite bands was playing there, and it was the perfect storm. And I ate. I only managed to eat four cheesesteaks. That's in, not bad. In five That's days. Four. Rookie, rookie numbers, you know, know, but it's a start. Um, we were well, okay, trying now to you have other to things me. is the is the problem. So you got you got to you got to let us know what was the band. Oh, failure. Okay, nice. Yeah, old old guy catnip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not to not to digress from our topic at hand, but it was one of those times where. You know, I'm not getting no younger, and I don't, like, really care about buying stuff. I just want cool life experiences. So I totally. splurged, yeah. splurged for the VIP meet and greet, and oh. it was, like, everything you would think. It was the dudes in the band are, like, really cool. Like, they weren't even jerks, and it was it was pretty great. Yeah, sounds like a win. Sorry, dear listener, for the digression, but we're all Ooh. enthusiasts of music. It's how we do. Is it my turn next? It is your turn right now. All right. This is another super easy sell uh, uh, for the room. The The album is uh, 10 out of 10 by Booter. This is a uh, guitar pop band from Winnipeg. Uh, just uh, it's mm, there's not a ton to say about this one. It's just super catchy, super breezy, super jangly, you know, um, 90s influenced guitar pop. Uh, it's one of those records where I can always put it on kind of no matter who I'm hanging out with. And it's just really great uh vibes really good energy um it's uh it's a lot of songs about you know crushes and breakups and it's really good at capturing that kind of breathless you know kind of butterflies in your stomach crush feeling um and uh uh it's yeah of the records you know that came out this year in this kind of lane it was the one that sort of ended up sticking with me and and coming back the most often I have heard about this album. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. So based on your recommendation just now, it just, you know, bumped itself <laughs> up much higher on my two listen list. It's just it's just really easy to get into. It's just real, really bubbly. And um, it's the kind of thing that just, uh, you know, it's the kind of record for me where I'll hear it once and think, oh, yeah, that was pretty good. But then like one song won't leave me alone and it'll drive me back to the record and I'll listen to it again and go, oh, this actually is one of my favorite albums this year. It turns out mm -hmm. I had. um. I'd interviewed the bassist from this band, who's a guy named uh, David Schellenberg, um, about a band he's in called Tunic, which is totally, you know, opposite energy, very uh, uh, chaotic noise rock band. Um, I had talked to them last year, and so it was super funny to have Booter kind of come out of nowhere this year with this super slick, sugary kind of poppy record that he was also involved with. So that was just a funny happenstance for me this year.
the silence is me googling Winnipeg. <laughs> Manitoba. Because I feel like that city can't be that big. Yeah. Um, uh, 700,000? I don't know. Yeah. I have no frame of reference for how big a city that is. Uh, Let me tell you two things I know about Winnipeg. Tell me. Jets yes. and the weaker lens. I know of the Jets. I do not know of the weaker lens. Okay. So the reason I was curious about the size is that in a town like ours, which is much smaller, if you're a decent, a lot of the decent musicians are in like four bands. Yeah. And I'm thinking that maybe the same thing is true in Winnipeg. Very likely true. They, the producer of this record has also um, worked with the, the weaker bands. So there's your, there's your answer there. All right. So they have a incestuous music community in the, uh, that's, that's probably a bad word. It, they have a collaborative. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And that's the versatile. impression that I get anyway, not being from there and knowing all of three things about it, about it as a city. Cool. No, see, I had never heard of Booter, B-O-O-D-E-R. I did Google it to make sure I spelled it right, and uh, now I have. So another one for my list. Uh, my next record, since since uh, Taylor went rock and roll, I'll go rock and roll. Uh, Mama, M-O-M-M-A. Uh, they're young, like in their 20s, but they make music that sounds like they listen to a lot of the music I listened to when I was a teenager. And um, yeah. Okay. I, I've never heard any of their older music. I just heard this newer one, which is called Household Name, and it sounds like late 90s, late, mid to late 90s music, a lot of vocal harmonies. A couple of songs sound Veruca Salt-ish because of the vocal harmonies, but that's not really their overall vibe. But uh, if you like distorted guitar and hooks, go check out Mama Household Name. I dig it. It's absolutely an honorable mention. It was one of the... Um several that were vying for my number 10 spot that like really pained me that I had to only choose 10. Um, I really love this album. It sounds like all of the stuff I was listening to in the nineties and, and really resonated with me the most, you know, the breeders Veruca Salt, all of those, like, you know, kind of women fronted bands that still managed to rock out. Um, this is definitely in that vein. And I, I love it. I've been playing it a lot. That sounds great. That sounds exactly like what I'm all about. So that's where I'm going after this is done. Um, yeah, the 10 spot is the is the hotly contested one, isn't it? It's so hard. See, this is why I don't bother after one. I just like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Julia's turn. OK, my next one is going to pivot us into a very interesting sonic space. It is the album Pigments by Don Richard and Spencer Zahn. Um, this is Don Richard's second release, um, though her first release was solo and was a little bit different. She's a New Orleans-based artist. Spencer Zahn is um, a neoclassical kind of chamber composer, and they collaborated on this album to create just this beautiful, lush, ambient, vibey kind of album that is all about his arrangements, her vocals just layered over them. Um, so I do two different radio shows. Kaleidoscope is my sort of indie rock, new music, modern music, music discovery show. And then I do this show called Alpha Rhythms, which is like ambient, chill, new agey kind of vibey stuff. And I love an album that can fit on both shows. And this is that album. It's um. You can listen to it track by track, and I can play a track on the radio, but it's even better as an album experience. You know, if you just want to put something on and chill for a little bit, um, especially in these winter months, just kind of relax and, and, and have a good time, you know, it's the perfect album for that. I had never heard of it. I Googled it, and I learned that Don Richard was in Danity Kane. Mm-hmm. So I've heard her voice before. This is not that. So yeah, I no, can't wait not. to get to this. <laughs> and this is not her solo album either, which is equally great, but this is something very different. Yeah, I can't wait to get to it. Nice call. I love this. Let's get weird. Uh, I have the perfect follow-up for this. My next pick is Jazz Codes by More Mother. This is the latest from 
poet and musician Keme Ayewa, aka More Mother, who's generally known for making these really noisy synth and spoken word albums. Um, and on the last couple records has been getting a little bit more melodic, a little bit uh, uh, more kind of approachable. Uh, in a way, this one is a tribute to kind of of the arc of of black musical history, um, and it's still very synthy and very abstract, uh, but with a lot of contributions from other writers and players from her free jazz ensemble uh, called Irreversible Entanglements, who are also excellent. Uh, and I've been a fan of her work in the past, and this one just hit me especially hard this year because this is a year I've been spending a lot of my free time trying to get more into jazz, and so it wound up being sort of a, a direct hit with me in that way. I kind of think of it as this kind of um, manifesto on improvisation as a way of like breaking out of different like patterns of thought and um, and different structures that way. And uh, this was just a record that really, it was one, I, I ended up taking a, a little bit of a um, hiatus or a sabbatical or what have you from music writing for a month. And I got to catch up on all the records that didn't really fit into my day-to-day -day listening habits. And this was the first one I put on and it just kind of, it was, it was just perfect in that moment of like, all right, let's take a break from all the normal ways of doing things. And let's just like get into something different that moves unlike any other album that I've heard this year. And, um, and that was, that was this record for me. It, it wound up being super, just kind of influential and something that I could just sort of, of, you know, get into to break up the way I was sort of going about my day to day. Nice. That sounds great. I'm excited to check that one out. The spelling on that is M O O R oh, mother, yes. not like the adjective for a greater amount. More Correct. Like the folks that lived in Spain for a while. Like that, yes. Philadelphia-based artist, apparently. I think so, yeah. Cool. Yeah, this is one I hadn't heard. Nice call. I can't wait to get into this. Uh, I'm just going to feel bad that my next one's not nearly as weird. <laughs> I'm going to try to make it sound weird. Uh, imagine, if you will, a two-piece band where one of them is cello. And they're really loud. By which I mean it sounds like if you closed your eyes, you'd think it was like a wall of guitars. But when you open your eyes, it's a cello. Uh, so that's what Lung sounds like from Cincinnati, Ohio, our neighbors to the south. Uh, their record from last year ended up on my top ten. And man, I didn't want to do it again, but <laughs> it's that good. Uh, the new one. What are you going to do? <laughs> Their Let It Be Gone is really good. First of all, nobody sounds like them. I can't think of anyone that's doing what they do. Cello rock riffs. Who who does that? Uh, I don't know that too many bands work as hard as them. They're true road dogs. In fact, they wrote this one while they were running around Europe and North America, which probably means that all of these songs were audience tested and, and approved before they went to the studio, which is a very old fashioned way of, uh, of trying out your songwriting. It's, it's good, they're good. Why do not more people know about Lung? Truly, truly. This is another one that was almost on my list and it pained me. And the only justification was that Come Clean Right Now was on my list last year. <laughs> the, uh, I almost, I was like, can I put the same band on there two years? I know. Like, ah, I yeah, yeah, so yeah. much. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I had, you know, this is apropos because I think I also had the last More Mother uh, record on my list last year, but I'm just looking at the Lung Bandcamp, uh, which is lunglunglung.bandcamp.com, and just that the, the record is tagged cello rock and grunge pop, and it's like, all right, well, yeah, I, I do need that in my life, I think. It is... I don't know that there's anything that would properly prepare you for what, for what they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, my, and especially if you go see them live... And you're like, they can't possibly be that noisy live. Oh, yes, they can. They are. Yes. I, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I love the cello. I played the viola in high school orchestra, and I always kind of wished I had chosen the cello like years into it. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, they're actually the cool ones over there. Did you ever think of putting your viola through, say, a pedal board? <laughs> and... <laughs> I would be lying if I said it hadn't occurred to me. But no, I never did. Yeah, it's, it's just a live, and also on the record, because obviously on the record they could do some more layering than just the two of them live. Right. Uh, but just 
big sounds and and the singer Kate is a classically trained opera singer. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, okay. So she can really sing, but this ain't opera. This is just it's often angry, energetic rock and roll, and more people need this in their life. Truly. I, I yield to Juliet now. Okay, so my number four is a much hyped release, but totally worth the hype. Blue Rev by Always. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. when yep. you have this much hype, wouldn't be a list. Wouldn't be a list without it. Truly, truly, when you have this much hype around an album to the point that the label on Twitter is creating memes about the hype that they're generating for this album, you're like, all right. This is either going to be worth all of this or it's going to be a massive disappointment. And this album totally delivers. It's also been worth the wait. This is always his first album in about five years. They had several false starts on this one. Um, You know, the pandemic, of course, but they also had a basement flood that like nearly destroyed all of their equipment and their recording space. Their masters got stolen. Um, So this has just been a hard road to get to this album. It is well worth it. It is just solid front to back, amazing song craft and just catchy as all get out. Um, I, I love it a lot. It's on a lot of lists. I like this record too. I I listened to this. This is one um I you know had to get on. I was I work nights at my real job, and so a lot of times I'm in the position of like, oh, it's midnight. What came out today? And so this is one I I put on as soon as it you know the clock switched over, and it's like, all right, the new Always is out. Let's go. Um, great record, and it's really also just it's it is satisfying to have something that fills that slot of like, what's the thing we all agree on this year? It's always everybody loves it. It's great, you know. Um, yeah. Great, great record. Man, I got to be the contrary curmudgeon here. <laughs> All right. I, I love that get... even more. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Tell us. I didn't dislike it. Okay. I thought, okay. It, was, I thought it was okay. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I don't know. The hype, it, it has eluded me. It is, it is, it is, I will say a record that like, I don't always know where I rank a lot of these, um, you know, annual kind of indie favorites like this record and the Alex G record is another one this year where it's like, I love that record a lot. And if everybody else is like gathering behind those kinds of, you know, this one and that one kind of as like the consensus picks, I'm like, yeah, that's great. Those are, those are great records. Um, there's a couple others like that, that are, are uh, eluding me right now. Um, but yeah, this is definitely not one that I have, um, put in a, in a ton of time with, but it's one I'm very happy to say like, yes, Let's all let's all talk about this record. It's good. I will say this. I understand why people are excited about this record. <clears throat> as opposed to say the wet leg record, which I don't <laughs> get why people like that at all. That so, one fell out of my I, I will say that was mid year. I was very bullish on that record and very quickly it sort of fell out of favor with me. But this this always record is not like that for me. But they yeah, those are both had a lot of press to, dedicated to them. Very true. And this mm-hmm. one, I see it. I mean, it didn't make my top 10, but I don't think it's a bad record. Uh, and I, I, I feel like I understand this band a lot more than I understand what like. But yeah, sometimes like the hype, I'm so late on getting to the records in the first place that by the time I hear all the hype, I'm like, oh, this has to be in this. I'm like, okay. This is the reason for my midnight strategy. I listen to things when they come out right away so that I don't have to be inundated with people telling me how great it is. I can just say, you're right. It's great. Um, so smart. You know, yeah. it, it, you have to, I have to sort of short circuit the hype cycle for myself in a, a lot of ways. Um, and with that in mind, um, I had a great time with this record. Yeah, I'm lucky with music that I get stuff early enough. Yeah, I'm um, really jealous that you get early stuff. Yeah, it makes it so much easier. But I'm I'm that way about TV. There are so many like seminal like streaming shows that are like five years, six years old at this point that I still won't watch just because I'm tired of people talking about them. And I don't want the hype to color my opinion of the thing. Yeah. So I completely get it. But we should be clear. You should go listen to this always record. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to think really. of what the song was that really got me. Belinda says, obviously, I think Pomeranian Spinster I thought was really good. I'm mm-hmm. looking at the track list now, which I'm trying to remember which one I thought was. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say because I thought it was pretty solid. All right, we all agree. It's not. Oh, it, it is it's not my turn, bad isn't it? It is your turn. 
<laughs> um, this is a blast from the mid year. Also, I um, I am eating my words a little bit because I remember an episode earlier this year where we talked about this record, and I said something like, you know, I think this is not on my year end list, but it should be on somebody's. Well, here we are. Uh, it's back, and the record is "Farm to Table" by Barty Strange. Um, I, I, I have to again give some local love uh, to Barty Strange, very eclectic indie rocker from DC, uh, and it's his debut album on 4AD. And um, I, when this record came out, it was not what I expected from the second Barty Strange record. I was such a fan of um, "Live Forever," his debut, uh, and this one felt like a downgrade in terms of energy. Uh, and over time, it was the kind of thing that has just kind of unfolded into something that I really, really love. Um, it's, it was, you know, it's the case where it's like, it's not what I wanted, but you know, it's not always about what I want. Uh, and what I love about Barty is strange is that he's in this very singular lane and he's doing what he does at his own pace. And, um, he's talked on this album cycle a lot about being inspired by TV on the radio. And when I heard that, it sort of made this click for me that it's like, you know, he's sort of, of of doing something very singular that probably isn't going to um you know resonate with what you expect and uh the second half of this record in particular where he sort of slows down and spreads out uh and it gets very sort of of um i don't know even what the word is maybe gentler more meditative it wound up being some of my favorite stuff the last song on this record hennessy is just spectacular uh amazing amazing album closer and uh, um, the whole second half as a whole, I really, really dug for this record. This one made my honorable mention list. Tennessee's my favorite song on it. Yeah. What I like about Bartiz is he clearly is making the music he wants to make. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like because that's how he's wired, and also he's an engineer, so he knows how to make it sound. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like everything he puts out, it's probably going to sound different than the previous thing he puts out because he likes to do a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. And this is also a case where I think the singles didn't really work for me as well as the deep cuts on the record. And so once I was able to get over what I thought about the singles, I realized like, oh, this is a great record. It's just the the representative like chunks were not working for me. Um, and once I was able to sort of see it, see the full picture, zoom out, get a bird's eye view of it, I thought, oh, yeah, this actually is way better than I thought it was. Yeah, it is. It was an honorable mention for me, too. And it is definitely one that I think is at its, at its best as a whole. Yeah, definitely. I really want to work with this dude someday. Um, <laughs> I hope you get to. That'd be awesome. I probably won't because his profile's gone up so much. Over to... I actually had a, had an exchange with him a couple of years ago before he like blew up, and I was working on plans to go to DC, and it you know it ended up not working out. And now I'm like, oh, well, now I can't afford him, and it's not like he's going to have the time anyway. I've never uh, met him, but one degree of separation on many fronts. It's one of those deals because DC people, a lot of DC people I know have worked with him. And it's, it's so he's one of those figures, you know, in the local scene where it's like, I know so many people who know Barty is strange, but I have never, never had a conversation with him. But oh, yeah, I, yeah. I'm such an appreciator of his work. That'll happen at some point. My camera just went <laughs> on the fritz, which is very annoying. Uh, my next one, I feel like I'm, we might have talked about this in like eight or nine months ago, Taylor. Uh, the feeder record made my year end. I didn't know that it was going to stick around that long. Yeah, that's uh, the first ever band I heard from Wales. Uh, I, I discovered them before Super Furry Animals. I knew that they were a thing. I discovered this band in the late '90s, and they keep making music. They're older now, but uh, the record they put out this year is called Torpedo. It's if you like 1990s rock, if you ever liked what this band has done in the past, you will like this. It's just louder and bigger and more mature themes. They're like they're old and older and kind of um, introspective now. And of course, they uh, a lot of the lyrics on this record were inspired by some sort of global pandemic. I don't know, something, something like that. But they managed to make the song sound optimistic even when it's not the happiest subject matter, and I have no idea how they do that. But yeah, a big rock and roll record with big distorted guitars. I dig it. Feeder, Torpedo. Sometimes that's what you need. You know, it's for all of the, you know, 
intricate, interesting, off the wall, avant garde things that we're all exposed to that are important and great and wonderful. Sometimes you just need a big old rock and roll record. So I get it. It's true. I've got a couple of those on this list where it's really like, you know, this is what I listened to the most this year. And that is, you know, an accomplishment, uh, even if there are more quote unquote accomplished records that might also deserve a shout out. So now we're in the top three range, aren't we? Yeah. All right, Juliet. Okay. My number three is Marchita, the debut solo album from Silvana Estrada. She is a Mexican songwriter um, who has just a stunning voice. It's a very simple kind of quiet album, just her and uh, guitars and strings. She actually comes from a family of makers of stringed instruments. Her parents are very well known in uh, Central and South America for being instrument makers. And so she kind of grew up in that environment of music, has really found her own voice and for own, her own sound. The uh, quattro guitar features prominently on the album, and it's just beautiful in its quietness. Uh, it's all Spanish language, and I just, I love it. It's lovely. You don't have to be a Spanish speaker to appreciate just the lyricism of it and and just the the wonderful um beautiful sound of her voice and her playing i have never heard of a quattro guitar so this Me is neither. my new rabbit hole i was going to ask you juliet if you knew what the word marquita means i do not uh but i'm betting you do mike so please tell me let's get bilingual I yeah to speak spanish it, it it means uh like dried up or withered is what happens to a flower when it when it, you know, gets uh -huh. curled and wrinkly. Um, the verb it comes from is marchitarse. So, yeah. Excellent. Ooh, that provides some additional context. Yeah, okay. I, can't, I can't wait to listen to this. It's it's just gorgeous. I love it. I, I fell in love with it right away. And she's also got an EP out this year that came out later in the year called Abrazo. That means hug. I was going to say, Aww. I think I know that one. <laughs> All right, uh, Taylor. All right, so now we're getting down to it. Uh, this one, uh, you want to talk about just solid rock records. Uh, I want to talk about Expert in a Dying Field by The Beths uh, from New Zealand. We've got just another really, really good guitar record. Elizabeth Stokes is the front woman of this band, and she writes just really exceptional melodies, really exceptional lyrics, plays uh, just really exceptional guitar. Everything about this is just everything I want from a kind of guitar pop record in this lane. It gets very loud sometimes with a song like um, uh, Silence is Golden. It gets it gets distorted and noisy. And um, all throughout, it's very lyrically considered. It's very well wrought. The title track, Expert in a Dying Field, is about asking the question of what you do with all the accumulated knowledge you've built up about somebody when you break up with them, um, which is one of the smartest breakup song premises I think I've ever heard. And it's at the same time, one of the catchiest songs I heard all year. This is a song that I just had like on repeat for weeks at a time because the melody is so impeccably put together. It is just perfect. It just like hits me right in the brainstem. It just like grabs me and doesn't let go. Um, and the whole album follows from there. That is the first song on the record, and it just keeps going one track after another of th those kinds of melodies, those kinds of structures that kind of weave around really well. And um, yeah, I can't get enough of it. This one made a lot of lists. I've been seeing it on a lot of lists. And I I don't always think this, but I think the title track is the best song on this record. It, it genuinely may be. I personally favor the song... Um, I think it's called Knees Deep. That for me is the one. It's the most cathartic to me and the most kind of, um, it's another case where I really love the lyrics, what's going on, the kind of multiple levels it works on. But you could pick any song here. I support you picking the title track. So yeah, the Beths, uh, before we move on, does anybody else have any further thoughts on that? Because I think it might be one, one of the few we all listened to. I just think it's a really solid rock record. It was not on my list, but that is not for not for any reason other than you can only pick so many. Right. Um, I really do like this one a lot. It's a good record. It made my honorable mention. So even though I didn't write that down in my uh, 
in my review, but it's it's one of the ones I liked. Um, so, Women Who Rock, let's, let's go to it. Um, we'll stay at that same theme. Even though I don't really think we can call the Linda Lindas women because they're children. Um, so, the Linda Lindas is on my list of the top 10. Uh, they're children from California. Uh, the record's called Growing Up, which talks, uh, I mean, they're kids. They write about kid stuff, like growing up and their pet cat and racist, sexist boys in school. And the record sounds really well produced and polished. That is because uh, uh, the father of two of the young ladies in this band is an industry professional, uh, an experienced engineer, producer, and he's got contacts. So one, when they record, it sounds really good because they're taken care of professionally. Two, they've been getting a lot of media and playing opportunities because of the connection. Set that aside. Can they play their instruments? Yes. Do they write their own songs? Yes. Are the songs... I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. You're doing like poppy punk rock. It doesn't have to be rocket science. This album is fun. I don't often listen to albums and be, that was fun. This is one I listen to, and I just want to keep hearing it because it's, it's fun. They are clearly at a point in their life where they, they're, they're still growing into their instruments, and obviously since... None of them have graduated high school, and I think one of them is still in junior high or middle school. They're still growing into their personalities, but you can tell they love playing. Any video you see of them doing a concert, it's weird to see a punk show where like everyone in the band has just got this big goofy grin on their face the entire show. Uh, but that's what their that's what their concerts look like. I watched one on YouTube the other day. They were playing like last week at some prestigious club in Los Angeles or whatever, and an hour, an hour set. So played more than this stuff just on the record. Jumping around, smiling, loving the crowd attention. I wish them all the success in the world. They keep playing their own instruments, and if they keep writing their own songs, I think they'll be fine. And I don't know how you could not like it. I totally agree. I I love them. I'm happy for them. I am also happy. For all of the people their age that are seeing um, that like rock and roll or like, you know, stuff on the harder side that have someone their age to look to and say this is possible. They aren't having to look at people our age, to, you know, aspire to they they can see like, oh, yeah, I can be. 13, 15, whatever. And I can be in a band and sound good. And, and I can, I can do it. I don't have to wait till I'm 20 or whatever. So I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited for them and about them. And I really, really hope that, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm of a like protect them at all costs yeah. attitude about them. I just hope that, you know, this, this fame that they're getting and the industry that they're in, um, that they can enjoy all of the success without it wrecking them in any way, because they are very talented and I want to see them succeed. I remember when that uh, video of them performing at the library went viral. And I remember, you know, talking about it with a friend of mine and my immediate reaction was, oh, wow, this is great. Good for them. And my second thought was, oh, I hope that they're OK. Um, and uh, that so I, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. I think they're great. I really enjoyed this album. Uh, fun, very fun. Um, and uh, yes, I I wish only the best for them going forward. I think that as long as they're still good at what they're doing, I mean, they're very young, but they play their instruments well. Their songs do not suck. Their live performances do not suck. <laughs> the harmonies they're singing are on point. The, I mean, the songs are simple, but when they play them live, they are executed well. You can tell they practice. You can tell they work at their craft. Hey, kids, keep that up, right? Uh, and if anyone's curmudgeonly about that, which I'm sure, look, I understand jealousy. Not all of us, like, start our first band and then get to go on all the late night shows and get taken We sure off. don't. Uh, you know? <laughs> but then they go do the late night shows and no one's helping you once you're on that stage. You got to play the song. <laughs> so then you got to, you know, they, they went out and do it. So 
Good for I them. I was horrified to learn recently that some guys I was in a band with in high school still like share around the videos of our old performances. And I'm like, no, stop. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, maybe the, maybe these ladies will look back in 20 years and, and no, I think they'll look back at 20 years and be like, how cool are our teens? That's Definitely they yeah. can. Yeah. It's work Make to be proud of. Yeah. And it makes me happy, too, that people like Kathleen Hanna and Slater Kinney are yes. are looking out for them and supporting yeah. them. Um, you know, those are the right folks for for, you know, young women artists to be aligned with and have, you know, have their backs. So totally. that's really heartening to me. There actually is a song on this record that reminds me of Slater Kinney with the bass. Uh, look, you're going to try to sound like the people that you're influenced by and you can draw a line from the Linda Lindas to a handful of like Riot Girl and punk bands, and I just think that's cool. For sure, totally agree. Uh, Juliet. Okay, so we are at our number twos. Uh, my number two is an artist that uh, has appeared on my list in previous years, though not last year because she didn't have an album last year. Uh, whose trajectory I am so excited about, uh, Sudan Archives with her new album natural brown prom queen um sudan archives uh blew my mind with her debut album confessions back in i believe it was 2019 and what i didn't know at the time when i first listened to it is that britney parks is actually from cincinnati so um not currently based in cincinnati but from cincinnati came up here learning the violin and she's back with her second album second on stone's throw and has kind of blown up her sound in the best possible way. You know, a sophomore album is a really tricky place with an artist. You're always wondering, you know, are they going to be able to replicate what made the first album special? Do they need to? Can they veer off in another direction? And she has just really created a triumph of an album. She's really trying to push her own boundaries as an artist. She said in a couple of interviews that she doesn't want to be pigeonholed as sort of the, you know, kind of hippy dippy black woman who plays violin. You know, she really wants to challenge listeners. And I think she's doing that on this record. Um, I am predicting that this is going to be the one that is going to really, really get her name out there in a big way. She just had a big piece in Pitchfork um, that's really giving it a lot of love. So I think 2023 is going to be the year of Sudan Archives. I actually heard this one. I dug it. What makes me sad is that I think getting out of Ohio is something she needed to do <laughs> to be the artist she wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Cincinnati was really her vibe or her scene, and it probably held her back. So I liked this record a lot, too. Uh, I'm glad that this was on your list, because this is definitely one that if I had spent more time with it, I have no doubt would have been up on, on my top 10 for sure. What is your number two there, Taylor? Oh, I guess I guess it's time. Um, <laughs> so are either of you familiar with the band Cheek Face? I am not, but I am no, Googling them tell. right now. <laughs> okay, I, have, I feel like I have to ask just because this is one of those, if you know, then I want, I want us all to be able to, to talk about it. But this is a, a band from L.A. Um, I feel like... Uh, anytime I try to say the word quirky, it sounds derogatory, but I don't mean it that way. This is a, a band that combines a lot of elements of garage rock and post-punk and power pop um, with this very like humorous uh, talk singing. Uh, the lead singer, uh, Greg Katz, is very, very funny, very good with a turn of phrase, um, really good at capturing just kind of the weirdness and awkwardness of life. Uh, in a way that I I don't think anybody else really can capture. Um, and so the first time you hear a Cheek Face album, it's like um, there's you you will laugh because every other line is a joke. Um, and the songs are catchy enough and sturdy enough to hold up after you are not laughing at the jokes because you've heard them before. Um, so there's a ton of replay value here. And then 100 listens later, you'll start laughing at the jokes again because you have forgotten them and then they hit you again. Um, and it, they are extremely quotable. Uh, my wife and I talk to each other almost exclusively in cheek face quotes now because this is a, a band that we have on in the house constantly. Um, 
if you're going to pick one song from this record, I highly recommend you check out the song We Need a Bigger Dumpster, um, which is uh, just just outstanding. It's the kind of song where anytime I just stop and think long enough about the chorus of it, I will burst out laughing just to myself in my office, uh, apropos of nothing. Um, they're a really, really solid uh, power trio of a band. On this record, they sound... Um, there's songs where they sound like LCD Sound System. There are songs where they sound like the Talking Heads. Uh, they're a really, really good musical trio that also just happened to write these very funny, not novelty songs, but um, just very witty, observational kind of songs. Um, so definitely one of my favorite bands of the past few years, and they have not let me down yet. Is the album called Too Much to Ask? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. I am on their wiki page and they released a couple of different things this year. Yeah, they um, are the kind of band where their B-sides are only um, kept off the record because they don't quite fit the um, group of songs they picked. So any given B-side release by this band is as good as the album. It's just that they're not the songs that got picked. So anything they put out, I will vouch for. It is great. They also did a cover this year of Anna Eng by They Might Be Giants, and that is my most listened track of the year um, by a, a weird fluke that just like caught me off guard and like wormed its way into my brain. Uh, another one of those I just had on a loop for weeks at a time. So that that might also give you a sense of where they're coming from. Uh, there's a lot of that kind of um, just kind of wackiness in what they do. I was going to ask you when you said the word quirky. Yeah. If you meant they might be giants quirky and i do ween quirky not ween quirky although ween is probably another big touchstone for them uh i just recoil because ween is not my kind of band but but they might be giants and ween are both inputs here for sure okay i like that we need we need a little wackiness in, <laughs> we in do our lives i it's, mean truly yeah. <laughs> I also have to shout out, if you've never heard them, there's a song on their last record called Emotional Rent Control um, that I highly recommend checking out. Emphatically, no. Yes, that's also a great record. All three of their albums are great. They're all, they're all good. There's not a bad one in the bunch. Well, this will be fun. I'll have to, this will have to be a mopey and need something to make me laugh. <laughs> uh, my next artist is not... If you need something to make you laugh, he's not your dude. So I'm gonna... Oh boy, here we go. Uh, Mobley. Mobley is from Austin, Texas. That's not his real name. That's his stage name. He grew up like partially in England, and he plays like trumpet and violin and piano and guitar and bass, and I think he can drum, and he self-produces, and he makes these music videos that are very thematic and are artistic projects in their own right. And he directs those and writes the story and stars in them and dances and edits it all himself. And I can't even, it's all right. So I think he's a genius and I'm totally a fan. And his latest project is called cry havoc, cry havoc with an exclamation point, which is, uh, it's not that long. It's an EP. But the songs are very, his lyrics are very pointed. And if you don't know what he's talking about in the lyrics, you're either being intentionally obtuse or you have no idea what's going on in the world. It's very much, his lyrics are very much a commentary on modern society and especially how he fits into it as a black man. But he does all that with like catchy pop songs with influences from hip hop and R and B and rock. So like you'll hear this like cool beat and then like he starts shredding on guitar and you're like, I did not expect that. Um, so for the, for the next EP, I'm going to say, I'm going to recommend one of the few times I'll be like, watch the videos before you actually sit down and listen to the EP. He made four videos that came to, that comes with this EP and they follow a character and it is best for you, dear listener, to watch these videos on YouTube or wherever in a specific order to get the full artistic impact. So the first one you should watch is his video for Theme Song, which he shot entirely in Johannesburg, South Africa, which is a really cool story, and I'm not going to tell it. He did an interview about it. Google it, and you'll, you'll see the story. But it's he ran off to South Africa for like three days and managed to shoot a music video. Uh, theme Song number one. 
Stay Volk number two. That's V O L K, like German for people. Stay Volk. I think there's a little, well, I don't think there's definitely some play on words there. Um, number three, Worst Way. And the last video you watch is Lord. And the reason you watch them in this order is because the characters that you meet in the first three videos are all in the fourth video for Lord. And the, the subject matter, the lyrics kind of wrap it all up. The songs are not ordered that way on the disc or on the digital record. But if you watch the videos in that sequence, you're going to get a cohesive story. And I think it's a genius project as an artistic whole. I don't know how he pulls this off live because I don't think he tours with the band, which means he's got to have backing tracks to give him all that sound. But since he plays a whole lot of instruments, I wonder if he decides, I'm going to play a piano on this one or I'm going to play a violin. I don't know how that works. Um, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to see him yet, but I would like to. And that is a lot of words about one dude, but he's worth it. And this out, and this EP is not that long, so you can get through it in not too much time. But the videos are really, like to me, the videos are truly an inspired artistic work of genius and deserve your attention. Multimedia. I love it. I have not heard of this at all. So this is a pleasant surprise. I love when something like this you know, it's a testament to how much great music there is this year that something can make that much of an impact, and I just have not heard of it. So that is uh, on my list now. He will, I believe that you will be moved. Okay. Because you are a human that is not a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I have heard his name um, only as somebody who is like just very, very adept at you know, making music in a multimedia space. And based on your description, Mike, I am so excited to check this out. I'm usually an album first video, second person, but I'm going to follow your advice and watch the videos in that sequence because it sounds like it's a really um, spectacular, special experience. I'm going to go watch it again as soon as we're done talking. I'm serious. It's like, I'm just in awe of his ability to tell a visual story and commit. Uh, you won't know this because you can't tell in the video, but his video for Stay Volk he shot that like in a warehouse in Austin and it was like 104 degrees in there. And Oof. you'll see this. He's wearing like Oof. a full suit and a thing on his head and he's dancing <laughs> some very energetic dances. And I remember reading an interview where he talked about just how miserable it was. And I'm, but you can't tell from the performance. But then uh -huh. when you know that you're like, well, how in the world did he do all that and not pass out? Um, I'm looking at that uh, thumbnail now and I can see I can see the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like once you know that it's hot in there, you're like, well, why would you do such a thing to yourself? But he suffered for his heart is what I'm trying to of say. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I've talked about Mobley enough, but I, I do truly think he's a is genius, it, and I would love to work with him someday. Is it time for the number one round? It is time for the number one round. Uh, ladies, ladies first. All right. My number one is the latest album from Ebay. It's called Spell 31. Uh, Ebay, not a new album artists they are a duo but new to me this year i uh, was really really excited to be introduced to them they are twin sisters lisa conde diaz and naomi diaz they uh sing in english french spanish and yoruba uh ebay actually means twins in yoruba and they are pulling so many different influences together in this album you've got a uh, little bit of rock, a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of jazz, down tempo. There's a little bit of trip hop in there, which I love, like really speaks to my heart. And um, I just, I love this album. It was one that I had on repeat all year. I actually received the tracks um, like two weeks prior to the album's release, got to hear it a couple of times and then got to see them like the day before the album came out. And their live performance just sealed the deal for me. There is so much energy and you can really feel their connection as sisters, you know, um, siblings that make music together. There's just something there and, and they've got that connection, just the way that they interact on stage and move around and their voices complement each other is really something to behold. And, and sonically, it is a fantastic release. I just really, really love this album, and I've been diving into their back catalog. I'm so happy I discovered them. I've never heard of eBay, and I just went to their wiki page, and I'm sold. Like, they have such a cool life story. Yeah. 
They really do. I have also never heard of them. So this is a pleasant surprise. And I love when the number one slot is a surprise. Yeah, it's hard to determine a number one. You know, I, I go back and forth. Like, is it is it the what we would call the critical categorical, you know, you know, for all of the reasons outside of myself, or do I pick as my number one, the album that just really stuck with me. And I played it over and over again this year. And I tend to opt for the latter. And this yeah. definitely um, uh, follows all of that criteria for sure. I think the best way to do it is the one where you're hanging out with your friends, having a beer or a snack, and you're like, man, I can't stop. Like, this album, you, the one that you talk to your people about when you're just, like, hanging out, that's the one that is the one. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's like I I can't necessarily quantify what was the best album this year, but I can tell you what made the biggest impact on me. Exactly. Um, I also... Uh, uh, should say that for my list, I wanted to exclude records that we had talked about previously on this show, just because there's so much great music. I feel like I could give airtime to other things. So there's a couple here that I've already talked about that wouldn't have been included, except that we had already discussed you and I, Mike, Dance yeah. Fever by Florence and the Machine. So I excluded that from my rankings. Wow. And you um, gave yourself like restrictions. Yeah. And well, you know, it's like I already talked about that and there's plenty of other stuff I could talk about. And the other one I've excluded here is my number one on the you know formal ballot that I submitted everywhere was Ethiopes by Billy Woods, which is a record that you and I talked about, Mike. It's one I've written about this year, um, you know, blurbed. And uh, 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 I, I had the opportunity to interview him earlier this year and so it's one where it's it's also a record that i'm not necessarily the number one person to talk about so it's like maybe uh i can i can let what i've said on that speak for itself and you can i can direct you to plenty of great coverage of that uh record that's been happening in the year-end space um so aside from that and aside from florence and the machine a record that really made an impact on me this year was changes by king gizzard and the lizard wizard which is um a band that i had not previously been super into uh, psychedelic jam adjacent band from Australia. I was aware of them. I had listened to their records casually. Um, and I had a chance to encounter somebody, uh, at a party this year came up to me and this person comes up to me and says, Hey, sorry, this is weird, but I'm getting kind of a vibe from you. And I was like, Oh yeah. And he says, yeah. Are you into indie music? And I said, Oh yeah. I'm into indie music. What are you, you know, what do you listen to? And he was like, I'm really into King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. And I said, all right, I will give them a second chance. And it just so happened that they were putting out five albums this year. They put out five different records in the span of a year. Um, and uh, the one that really stuck with me and sort of prompted me to do a real deep dive on their whole catalog is the most recent one called Changes which is where they're sort of um, playing with some uh, jazzier kind of influences. There's a very rigorous music theory concept behind the whole thing. Uh, and yet it also is just still a super fun, jammy rock record um, that uh, uh, is just a real joy to listen to. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of, of classic rock influences on this record alongside jazz. And um, there's, uh, um, I think it's five or six songs that all sound different, but all of a piece with the concept. And um, there's some synthier kind of more driving tracks. There's one called Gandhi that might've been my favorite. And also there's a, a very like, there's a song on this record that's been getting compared a lot to like a Hotel California kind of, of jam uh, called um, Nobody, which is also excellent. There's this, there's funky sort of, um, um, there's a song called AstroTurf, which is based on this really funky flute part. Um, this record just goes a hundred different places in the span of of not uh, you know about forty minutes. A uh, very compact record, and it really shows off a lot of the best of what this band has done in the the past. Um, I had this number memorized. I think this is their twenty fifth record or something like that. Um, another super prolific, extremely broad kind of act, uh, and this is just kind of everything I have come to love about them in a very compact package. There's a gentleman in our music community, a uh, former podcaster named Terry Izzy Rock Martin. And he was the fellow that would interview all the musicians in our town every Wednesday. And he loves this band. Mm -hmm. 
and he's been trying to get me to listen to them for a while, and I just <laughs> I don't know where to start. But one thing that I'll he send says, you ten. I'll send you ten records. How about that? Please do. But one thing he <laughs> says is that every album they write it like in a completely different genre. Just about. He's like, Just so about. if you want to hear a metal record, they've got one. If you want to hear a folk record, they've got one. You want, I'm like, oh, I, that's, that's very confusing. Also, from a <laughs> creative standpoint, wow, that's pretty cool. They're the kind of creative people I aspire to be, which is they're very kind of unsentimental about it in terms of just like trying things. And it almost always re results in something very unselfconsciously interesting and cool. They're, they have this very neat ethos that I think is really admirable. I always find it interesting to see what different people's entry point is with them. Like yeah. what's the album that hooked them? Because I feel like they're the type of band that once you find that album and connect with it and then go back and explore that back catalog in that context, like they can make a fan out of you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be different for everybody as to which one is really the one that Absolutely. makes them understand this band. I also misspoke. This is their 23rd album. I feel like that's important. 23, but... 25. Yeah, I know. It's actually, now that I say that, <laughs> it's, it's not that important. Records. It's really not. For me, that record was, um, that, that really, really, truly hooked me was Nonagon Infinity, which is their most noisy, lo-fi, psychedelic, just dudes rock album. And it's one of those where it's like, well, yeah, okay, you got me. You know, it's like, I didn't think I was going to be into a band like this. And yet they're just so, you know, infectious and fun. I should thank you because I had never heard of Billy Woods and we did talk about that that record earlier this year. And that because, record's great. because of you, I actually listened to Ethiopes and the one before it. Hey, Hiding Places, right? Was before yeah. that? Uh or am I, I wrong? I don't remember. I just remember listening to it. I don't think I'm an authority to talk about him either because he's he goes a lot deeper and harder than I am accustomed to in the rap music that I've consumed in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh but you're right. That his record shows up in a lot of uh, year end lists. I've I've seen it on a lot. I think uh, uh, it was either Brass or Terror Management. Now I'm looking at his catalog. Anyway, another very prolific artist. He did a, a you know team up album with More Mother also that is excellent. Uh, cannot recommend Billy Woods enough. My number one is not going to surprise you, Taylor. All right, I'm ready. It's it's the Oceanator record. Yeah, it is. And and. <laughs> Taylor did an interview with Elise <laughs> this year, and I was very jealous because I'm totally a fan, and I'm like, I wish I could talk to Elise. Uh, and it's co-produced with her very tastefully named brother, yes, and Vardy Strange, yeah, because they're friends. So since they're friends, she can get on, she can get them services with a lot easier than the rest of us. It's now see Taylor because he's a professional and heard this record before it was out, and I remember specifically being jealous. When we talked about it, because we talked about it, like, I think at the end of our quarter one chat and it was coming out in quarter two or was it? The yeah, end of quarter two I'm, I'm sorry for that, by the way. That was unfair because no, it's were... okay. <laughs> it made for a fun conversation, but it was like right at the end of one quarter and it was going to come out in the next quarter. And he's like, I've already heard it. It's great. And I'm like, well, it's not even <laughs> out yet. We can't like. <laughs> and it is great. Uh, it. The the her adding that baritone guitar really gave her like a whole different a different sound and it's the exact kind of rock record I want to listen to when I want to listen to a rock and roll record, and it's nice that right there's kind of a glass ceiling in the business for women in in that genre and she went out and made a great record especially a brown woman so uh it, it, it's really good and then she went on tour and I didn't get a chance to catch catch her on on the road but I would love to. It sounds pristine. The songs are good. It sounds great. And I told the gentleman who's going to produce my next record, um, well, I, I, don't, I think he forgot, but I'll remind him when we go to the studio. The next time I do a rock record, this is the, if it doesn't sound as good or better than Nothing's Ever Fine, then we haven't done the work right and we got to start over. Because this sounds so well engineered and produce and then of course the music video she did for bad brain days is like it's awesome it's like there's like cartoons and it's yeah um the oceanator record that's my favorite record of the year i think well she 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 wore herself out on the road this year she's talked on twitter about being tired so i think she's gone home now and is probably hibernating because it's cold but uh i hope she makes another record because uh, i will buy whatever she puts out probably she's great I feel like Taylor probably agrees with this. I do. I, I love this record a lot. It was one that was very um, 
well-timed just for me where I'm at in my life, uh, just emotionally. There's a lot on this record that was really speaking to me pretty directly in a way that is like I, you know, put this on for the presser the first time and like was in tears three minutes later. It was that kind of deal for me, the first couple tracks on this record. Um, yeah, this is a great one. This could easily have been an, on my list, except I knew that you would bring it up. So that is, uh, uh, yeah, well-deserved and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan. This is one that has been on my radar for a while, but I haven't gotten to. And now I feel like I must, as soon as we get done with this conversation, go listen to it and spend some time with it. I do and think also read Taylor's interview with her in post trash. It's really okay. Cool. We'll do. Shameless right, Taylor, plug. Go ahead. <laughs> I feel like uh, um, there were more approachable singles on uh, her last record, Things I Never Said. And that record, I think, um, hit a little bit bigger just because of that. Also, that record came out in the summer of 2020. And when you put out a song in the summer of 2020 called A Crack in the World, it's like, well, you know, yeah, you, you, you know, <laughs> obviously that was a song that she had had for years earlier, but there's um, a lot of, of things on that record that were like um, scary, accurately timed just for when they came out. And I think this record is the same, only maybe not quite as acute the way people are feeling it right now. Um, but I think it satisfies the same thing of like, uh, it's a very good reflection just kind of of, of life. And it's uh, something that, that really um, spoke to me this year. Well, this is more of an album as an artistic statement. I That's think, true. I think you're right. Like she starts it off with a song about morning. There's a song about post Meridian in the middle and she ends it with a, with a track about evening. Yeah. There's, it's clearly effort put into sequencing and taking you on a, on a voyage Definitely. and the name of the record, nothing's ever fine. Well, who would say something like that? A depressed, <laughs> anxious person. It, the whole album is, is kind of, a, is, is telling you what it, what being depressed kind of feels like. Yeah. Different aspects of that. And as a person who's depressed, I'm like, I get it. Yeah. So I can understand how, how it, you're right. It's pro like there's not like a whole handful of singles, but as I'm one of those people that likes to listen to records straight through. So for yeah, me, of this course. Is like, so this is for you. This is what I wanted to hear from an artist, you know. So yeah. Uh, so real quick, thirty seconds each. What are some of the stuff that made your honorable mention list, Juliet? Go. Um, other than the ones that we have already discussed, uh, like Lung and Mama, um, other ones would be the Orville Peck album, Bronco, uh, the Wise Blood album, which just came a little too late in the year for me to spend enough time with it. Uh, and I got to give some love to my dude, Father John Misty. Um, I His new album is very different than his prior releases, uh, but it's very fun and I enjoyed it very, very much. That's really good. See, you can tell she's a radio professional because she knows how to get all of her thoughts out in less than 30 seconds, but like sound coherent and like clear. <laughs> this is like, I, I'm really impressed. Uh, Taylor, you're I'm a podcaster, so I'm going to try not to chase any squirrels in the next 30 seconds. But um, I will say that any of the records I talked about as being just really solid pop rock records, you could control F and replace Emotional Creature by Beach Bunny. Um, really good record, really good sophomore record. Um, speaking of that, I think that uh, uh, she really nailed it. And it was really exciting to see her kind of grow on this record. I also want to shout out The New Faith by Jake Blunt, who is a... Um, folk musician and scholar uh, who made a concept album placing traditional folk songs and spirituals in uh, this frame story about a future community of survivors in the wake of societal collapse due to climate change. And he did not have to change any of the lyrics of these old songs. Wow. Um, it is it is a very cool uh, exercise. Um, and he's a very talented fiddle player and banjo player. Uh, I also want to shout out uh, Guilty Pleasure by Cheem, which is my pop punk uh, record pick for the year um sort of some hyper pop elements it's very genre diverse and it's just super fun all the way through uh and also it's one of these records where you can hear them trying something different there's a lot on this record i hadn't specifically heard before and that's always an exciting feeling that was more than 30 seconds but i'll allow it ah here are mine uh coffee k-o-f-f-e-e -E, a young like 21 year old reggae singer 
Excellent, excellent work. The Smile, but that's big label. We won't say anything else about that. Uh, Calexico, who I just discovered this year. Shame on me for not listening to Jill Stahl years ago when she told me to listen to them. Great record for them. Some of my favorite bands of the 90s put out stuff this year. Big Rex EP was great. Stabbing Westward's record sounded like a Stabbing Westward record. Super Chunks album, very good. Placebo's album, also very good. Collective Souls album, superb. They can still cite. They can still songwrite. And for my wife, shout out to the Harold Hensley record. He's a folk singer from here in Dayton. I like it, but my wife really likes this new album. And if you like earnestly sung folk songs, roots music, go listen to Harold Hensley. That's it. Thanks, everybody. That was fun. Thanks so much, Mike. Any Thank last you. words? No? All right. Well, let's do this again in like 365 days. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you once again to Juliet and Taylor for having this conversation. I hope you can tell how enjoyable it was for us. And again, dear listener, I hope you discovered something that you go out and listen to from our conversation and that it moves you. This is the last episode of 2022. Uh, number 74. That's, that's a lot, right? If you've been listening, thank you very much for doing so. I'm going to have some more conversations with some more interesting and talented people coming up for you next week. Come right on back and we'll keep this going. Have a lovely weekend, everyone.